flowing in the story, having a direction, having a um, an economy of words, uh, trying not to stray uh, stray off topic and that sort of thing. I, uh, so it's it's storytelling. It was, uh, but I didn't write my first novel until Once We Were Brothers, and that was written maybe 10 years ago. So the question I frequently get asked is, uh, why did it take you so long to begin to write novels uh, if, if that's something you wanted to do? And uh, to, to that, I can only say that uh, you know, life, life gets in the way, practicing law and raising a bunch of children and uh, uh, all those things that, that we find that are necessary when you raise a family, uh, they kind of get in the way. Uh, and, and also, and I think this is probably just as important, uh, when you write a legal brief, you're assigned a topic. There are facts, there are law, you have to focus on them. It's very restrictive writing. Um, if you're writing a novel, I think something has to grab you. Something has to grab you and shake you and say, you know what, this is something you can get passionate about. This is something you can tell a story about. This is something you can dive into and work on for a year or two. Uh, and, and, uh, and so that didn't happen to me uh, until I got assigned uh, on a case that took me to Poland. Now, let me see if I can get some of these pictures going. Okay, slideshow. From the beginning, there we go. Um, my case took me to Poland, um, even though the case itself was in Chicago. One commercial entity was suing another commercial entity over telephone service to be installed in the Southern Poland. You can see it says Lesser Poland down there. That's a very mountainous area. Didn't have very good telephone service. And uh, my clients uh, made a contract with Motorola to put in that telephone service. Uh, but the contract fell apart and one commercial entity blamed the other. And when that happens, why that's how I put food on the table uh, for 50 years. Anyway, the, the lawsuit was here in Cook County, but uh, the witnesses were all in Poland and uh, the places where the installation was to occur were all in Poland, the government officials all in Poland, documents were in Polish. And so I had to spend a lot of time in Poland, in Warsaw and in some of the smaller cities. And I have to tell you that being there uh, on business, working uh, is quite a bit different than if you were to go there on a tour. So if you were to go there on uh, like the March of the Living or something to, to, for the purpose of seeing historical events and expecting to see those, um, that, that's different. When I went there, I expected to work. So my concentration was on taking depositions and interviewing witnesses and uh, government officials and that sort of thing. But it's pretty hard <laughs> to go to Poland and not be affected by the fact that the country ceased to be. Um, it was, uh, it, it was, uh, totally devastated during the war. Now the, uh, the, left, the left side of Poland, the whole Eastern side of Poland was annexed into Germany, became part of Germany. The, uh, the Western side of the, uh, I'm sorry, the Western side annexed and the Eastern side be, became what they called living space for the German people. And, and we know how many people were killed, how much property was seized. Uh, and, and, and you can't, you can't take a walk, uh, for example, in, in Warsaw, or even in some of the smaller cities, you can't take a walk that you aren't confronted with a memorial or a monument uh, or a plaque. I remember one night, uh, we, we took a walk, we were eating in a restaurant, uh, our group, and uh, we walked down the, down the street, side street, and there was a building, a brick building, and there were holes in the side of the building and a plaque that said, here in uh, 1943, the Germans executed 22 people. Uh, it, it, it's just so overwhelming. It's just so moving to be there. It's, it's unlike any experience that I've ever had. And, 
And so it spoke to me and it said, if you're ever going to write a story, a, a novel, create characters and that sort of thing, right? This is something you can do. And so I decided that I would write a story about an ordinary Polish family um, and uh, what life would have been like for them uh, when the Nazis uh, occupied uh, their village, their town. I picked the town of Samosz, which was typical, which is 25 to 30,000 people, maybe a third Jewish. Uh, the family uh, is one that I, I could personally relate to as a middle to upper middle class family, uh, owned a business, had, had a good moral compass for their children. They had a son and a daughter. And, and then they took in uh, uh, a child who, uh, who was not Jewish, uh, as, as took him in off the streets, just like an orphan. And uh, they raised the two boys as though they were brothers, only to find that when the Nazis uh, came, uh, the non-Jewish boy uh, betrayed the family. And then of course they met, they meet up 70 years later uh, and confront each other. That book became Once We're Brothers. Um, incidentally, I mean, if, when you start to, when you practice law, uh, and you go to law school and you practice law, you know what to expect. You know how the profession works. Uh, if you start to write novels, um, you really step outside the bounds. I, uh, I, wrote, I wrote Once We Were Brothers. It took me about three years. And then I have a manuscript, 400 pages or so. And, and now, you know, it, it, what do you do with it? Uh, it's one thing to have a, 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 write a manuscript. It's another thing to... Uh, have people read it. Uh, how do you get this into people's hands? You just, something that I never considered foolishly, um, but uh, uh, I uh, contacted several uh, publishers, I contacted several literary agents and I couldn't get anybody interested in Once We Were Brothers. Uh, but I wasn't gonna let it fall because I'd worked too hard on it. And so I, uh, I said, well, you know, I'm a lawyer. Uh, I'll make my own publishing company what could possibly go wrong? Uh, I could tell you plenty, but uh, so I published it myself and, uh, and it did well, um, surprisingly. I mean, it's just one of those lucky things uh, it, uh, because books sell by word of mouth. Uh, you have to ask yourself, uh, how did you come to read the last book that, that you read? And it's probably because a friend of yours said, I've got a book, I, li I really liked it, you should read it. Or, or you said to someone else, a friend of yours, oh, I've just finished this book. Why don't you, you would like it? Or you're in a book club uh, and Dana's recommended it. Thank you, Dana. So uh, uh, I, uh, I, I did well with it. And, and then it was picked up by a publisher and the publisher uh, republished it. And, and this was the republished second edition. And then the publisher said, what, what else have you got for us? Well, at the time, uh, one of my kids uh, had left college and decided uh, college wasn't important enough for him. He wanted to go to Israel and join the IDF. Wasn't my first choice, but uh, he did that. Uh, and uh, of course, when you have a son serving in the IDF, uh, you have to go to Israel uh, several times a year. And uh, we did. And here, here are the, these kids and their kids. They're, they're, 19, 20 years old, and they're, uh, they're serving in the most dangerous places on earth. Uh, my kid and his unit, they were near Hebron, which is so dangerous, and, uh, but uh, they do what they do. Anyway, I decided uh, making those trips there, another story grabbed me. I wanted to tell a story about uh, Hebron and why, uh, and really de dig deep into uh, the history of the Palestinian-Israeli dispute. So that became Saving Sophie. And Saving Sophie, um, there's a, a, a young Jewish uh, uh, lawyer who works for the State Department, uh, meets a Palestinian girl overseas. Uh, she's a pianist and uh, they, uh, they fall in love. Uh, her father's a strict Palestinian father, doesn't want his daughter to have anything to do with an American, let alone a Jewish American. But being in love and young and whatnot, they run off, uh, get married, move to Chicago, and they have a child. The child is Sophie. 
tragically, the, uh, the mother dies and uh, the grandfather uh, comes over to, for visitation and uh, kidnaps Sophie, takes her back to his compound in Evron. And the book is uh, the father trying to rescue his child uh, from, from the Palestinian uh, city of Evron. Um, that was Saving Sophie. While I was in the middle of writing Saving Sophie, I was, I was going on my book tour for Once We Were Brothers. Uh, that's when we did things in person and uh, not on the computer. Uh, and when, when you do a, a talk like that and you get to meet people and, or people will come up after the talk and talk to you. Uh, and, and I was always humbled by the fact that people would come up and say, you know, I'm a survivor and I read this book and I really liked it. Or my, my mother was a survivor and, and this happened to her. She was in this camp and they'd share those stories with you. It's really very touching. And, uh, and even, you know, if, if you know about those things, they, they many times won't share them with their own families, but here they talk to me, a fiction writer. Anyway, one woman uh, came up to me and, and her name is Faye Waldman. She lives uh, in the suburbs of Chicago and uh, said, uh, you know, I read Once Your Brothers and uh, I, I thought I was reading about my own family. You got it just right. When uh, no author ever gets better praise than that. And we talked for a while, we had lunch together and she told me her story. This is a picture of her, by the way. She was a remarkable woman, tall, strong, beautiful woman. Uh, this is a picture of her in 1978 when the Nazis were trying to march through Skokie, Illinois. I don't know if you remember that. Uh, Skokie was, and probably still is, a community predominantly Jewish, and at that time uh, had a number of, of survivors in Skokie. And uh, the Nazis, of course, they chose that. They wanted to march through Skokie. Well, the mayor of Skokie said, nuts to you, I'm not giving you a permit. Uh, they got the ACLU to take him to court and uh, and force him to give him a permit. Uh, and so this is Faye uh, leading a protest against the Nazis marching there. They never did march through Skokie. Uh, uh, they, whatever, uh, but they didn't. They didn't march there anyway. Uh, Faye uh, told me her story. Uh, she grew up in the town of Shanoff, which was, again, another town, 25 to 30,000 people. Uh, she, uh, uh, it was a third Jewish. Uh, her, she was from a nice family. Her, her father was a captain in the Austria-Hungarian army. So they fought side by side with the Germans in uh, World War I. And, uh, but that didn't matter. They were Jewish. So when the, when the Nazis occupied Shanoff, they came to arrest them. And uh, he, her father hid uh, Faye up, up, up in the attic, uh, told her not to come down. So she stayed up there for weeks and then uh, only came down to get food and that sort of thing and uh, made her way out to a farm finally and then got arrested and was sent to a slave labor camp and then to Gross Rosen concentration camp. And then uh, ultimately she was sent to Auschwitz and she escaped on the Auschwitz death march. She was a remarkable woman and that was a remarkable story. And then she told me about these two little girls, these two babies, these twins. And uh, I said, listen, I'm, I've, got to, uh, I've got to write that story. And she said she'd help me write it. Uh, and God bless her, she, uh, uh, she uh, wasn't well enough. Uh, when I finished Saving Sophie uh, and started to write the book, but her family helped me out. If you look at this, if this map, this is a map of Poland in 1939. So you can see it's quite a bit different from the map I showed you before. Uh, and her town of Shanoff was right in the corner where you see Katowice and Krakow. Um, uh, just, just a remarkable story. And uh, so I, uh, that, that story became, uh, Carolina's twins. It's it's really the story of Faye's life, but but fictionalized, uh, with with some different characters, but based based on her life. Um, Dana was right when she said I actually wrote a story that had nothing to do with Jews, uh, although I, 
I did put in uh, a Jewish girlfriend for Liam for a period of time. Um, but I, I was always fascinated by <clears throat> what happened in Northern Ireland uh, during what they called the Troubles, which was a 30-year war between the Protestants and the Catholics. I know you all remember that. <clears throat> and I, we saw it on TV, but I never knew why or whatever. And so I, I wanted to research that and write a story about it. And that became the trust. You know, Liam goes back to Northern Ireland to solve a murder mystery. And I really I didn't have a Jewish base, but hey, has, he has a Jewish girlfriend, um, <clears throat> which became an issue. Um, after that, I wrote The Girl from Berlin. The Girl from Berlin came about um, because I had been reading um, a lot about uh, interwar Berlin, that period of time between the First World War and the Second World War uh, in Berlin. Um, and, and with the focus on what happened to, uh, to professional uh, Jewish professional artists, musicians, uh, writers, that sort of thing. Because there, uh, at that period of time, between the late 20s and the early 30s, there was an explosion of culture in, in, uh, in Germany and in Berlin. Uh, they called it the Weimar Republic. It was a Weimar culture. Anyway, and then, then 1933, when, when uh, Hitler was appointed chancellor, everything changed. So I wanted to uh, write a story about uh, which would have that as its uh, foundation. But uh, in, in a few years ago, my, uh, one of my kids, a different kid, uh, wanted to take his uh, junior study abroad. Now, when I say uh, study, uh, I kind of put that in quotes. Um, he wanted to study in Florence. I want to study in Florence. Uh, but there he went. He spent the summer in Florence, and I came out after at the end of the summer, and we got a car and drove around and uh, saw the sights in Italy and so he could show me around. And, and uh, of course, we drove through Tuscany. And if you've ever been to Tuscany, uh, you know it's really a, a delightful place. And if you've never been there, make sure you get there. It, uh, but there are so many wineries, and it's, and it's lovely in there. They'll tell you, uh, show you the winery, take you down in the cellars, and let you taste the wine, and and it, it's just a it's just a lovely experience. And uh, many times they will they will you think to yourselves, well, this winery must have been in this family for four hundred years. And many times you'd be right, but more often than not, we would hear them say, this winery is owned by a German corporation which started me to think. We know that, in, uh, that Italy was, was one of Germany's partners in the Second World War in, in the Axis. And uh, we know that uh, Italy uh, surrendered in 1943, they capitulated and Mussolini was, uh, was ultimately hung and, and, uh, and then Hitler sent his armies uh, south into Italy, all the way to Rome. And we know when they did that, aside from the fact that they, that they uh, killed any number of people, it was a brutal occupation, but they seized a lot of property. At the end of the war, they were supposed to give it back. They didn't always do that. Um, and so sometimes people were dead, they couldn't be found, or sometimes they just didn't give it back. And that's been an issue, I have to tell you, for 70 years. Uh, and, and not too many years ago, there was a... Uh, treaty uh, signed, a declaration signed by 47 countries called the Terezin Declaration, which said that if uh, you could prove pr your property or your family's property was, was taken uh, by the Germans or through the Germans um, uh, during uh, the Nazi years, uh, you could get it back or you could be compensated. Um, I actually met a woman whose husband, uh, her husband's family, owned a, a, a building in downtown Berlin, right in downtown Berlin in the Mitte. And, and actually, not too many years ago, proved that it was his and, and was compensated for it. So uh, in The Girl from Berlin, we start off in uh, Tuscany, uh, where a woman, uh, Gabby, is about to lose her farm. She has a farm. She has a little winery uh, to a big 
Italian conglomerate, a wine cor corporation that says they have better title than she does. She uh, prevails upon Catherine and Liam to come to Italy to help save their farm. But before they leave, they are given a manuscript written by a, a woman 70 years ago. That woman is the girl from Berlin, Ada Baumgarten. Uh, now Ada uh, is growing up during that interwar period that I was talking about uh, between the late 20s and, and the early 30s. Uh, this, this could, any one of these little children could be Ada. This is a picture from the girls' school, girls' elementary school in, in Berlin on uh, Aranienberger Strasse. Uh, you can visit that today. It's, it's there, it's open. Um, and uh, it has a number of uh, just delightful pictures. Uh, but uh, her father is a musician. He is a professional violinist. In fact, he is uh, first violinist, concertmaster for the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra, maybe one of the finest orchestras in the world at that time. Uh, the conductor is Wilhelm Furtwangler, one of the finest conductors in the world at that time, certainly. Uh, Ada uh, is given a violin by her father on her sixth birthday, and she becomes a prodigy. She is gifted. Uh, she excels in the junior orchestra. She's quite talented. And all she wants to do when she grows up is to sit next to her father in the orchestra and uh, play music. And uh, she's good enough to do it. But I want you to look at this picture of the Berlin Philharmonic, and I want you to count all the women that you see. There are no women. Trick question. Um, there are no women in the Berlin Philharmonic. There are no women in any major orchestra in the world at that time. Not London, not New York, not Philadelphia, Chicago, Boston. No major orchestra has a, 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 a woman member which is extraordinary. And, you know, sometimes I get asked, when you do your research, does anything really astound you? Well, when you research World War II, a lot astounds you, but, but that astounded me. I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, certainly there have been uh, talented women and women soloists, women in string quartets all through that period of time, but they were never allowed to be members of any major orchestra. Not really until the 60s and the 70s. It's extraordinary. Anyway, she, that's what she wants to do and she's good enough to do it. And she's growing up and her parents are, uh, are, are certainly uh, doing what they can to further her career. But obviously in 1933, everything changes. Hitler becomes chancellor in 1935. The uh, Nuremberg laws are passed, uh, stripping away a, a lot of the privileges uh, uh, for uh, Jewish businesses and Jewish uh, professionals. So with that, her parents make sure she gets sent somewhere and uh, else, and that became Bologna. She's sent to Bologna to play for the Bologna State Opera. But uh, this was like the second thing I wanted to focus on. Um, I wanted to focus on what, what happened to the Jews in Italy during this period. We, we know a lot about what happened to the Jews in, in Germany uh, af after uh, Nazification, but what happened to the Jews in Italy? Because they were, they were Germany's partner and, and uh, what, what was it like for them? And that's what I wanted to write about the second part of, uh, of Girl from Berlin. And it, it really, it falls into three different periods. Um, before Mussolini became close to Hitler, there was really no persecution, no anti-Semitism at all uh, in Italy. In fact, there weren't that many Jews in Italy. I mean, there were really only like, 15, 16,000 Jews. But, um, but once Mussolini became uh, enamored of, of Hitler and, and chose to try to emulate him in many ways and please him, uh, he started to enact his own racial laws, uh, taxing Jews, uh, closing the public schools to Jewish children and, and that sort of thing. Uh, so that was like the second period. And then during the war, um, when, when they were actually uh, together and uh, uh, it became uh, far, far stricter for the Jews. But the, the, the Italian people never really bought into it like they did, like they did in Italy. And finally, uh, when, when Mussolini uh, was gone, when, when Italy capitulated, the Nazis uh, 
occupied all the way down to Rome with the instructions to round up every Jew and send them north to the concentration camps. So that story really tells, uh, once uh, the, the girl from Berlin really tells the story of what happened to, to Jewish professionals and Jewish families in, in uh, Berlin and also in, in Italy. Um, I wanted to show you this picture because this is a picture of the Philharmony, uh, which is where the Berlin Philharmonic plays today. Uh, and uh, it, it's a lovely building. Uh, it's not like the old building where they used to play. That was bombed to smithereens. But this is the new building where the Philharmony plays. And this is the plaza. And look at the statue out in the plaza welcoming you to the Philharmony. Huh, how ironic. It's a woman. And it's a woman violinist. And that uh, shows you how times have changed. Huh? Anyway, <clears throat> uh, that was the girl from Berlin. Now I, I tell you about uh, Eli's promise. What was I trying to draw upon when I wrote Eli's Promise? Well, I, uh, Eli's Promise, as you know, spans three time periods. Uh, and so in many ways, uh, Eli is symbolic. He's symbolic of the Jewish migration. He's in Central Europe during the occupation, during the, uh, the, the terrible uh, happenings of the Holocaust. Uh, he is then af after the war, he is in a displaced persons camp. And then ultimately he migrates to America and uh, winds up in a, uh, a multicultural uh, uh, area of Chicago, uh, similar to Brooklyn or areas of Philadelphia where, where uh, uh, Jewish refugees settled after the war. Um, I wanted to tell the story of Lublin uh, Lublin is a, uh, 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 an, a an extraordinary town uh, because it is the seat of Jewish learning. It, uh, uh, it, it may be in all the world at that time. Uh, it, uh, that, it, the yeshiva was there, uh, uh, which was uh, uh, the center of Jewish learning. Uh, it, was, uh, the, it had the most extraordinary Jewish library in the world. Uh, it was very, very difficult to get into this school. Uh, Yeshiva Kachmei Lublin means school of the wise man uh, in Lublin. And it, uh, uh, you had to be just a top student uh, and you had to memorize 400 pages of Talmud uh, just, just to apply. Um, and for that reason, of course, Lublin is a focus uh, for the Nazis. It's a target. And they, uh, they're interested in uh, uh, Lublin as a center for many of their activities to make uh, to make Central Europe Juden free. So um, they occupy this uh, yeshiva uh, immediately. Uh, they make it a police station. They take all these uh, fabulous writings, the Torahs and whatnot, and they take them out to the street and burn them in a bonfire. Uh, so. The story begins in, in, in Lublin. Uh, Eli Rosen is, is a good man. He's married to Esther. She's a good woman. They have a son, Itzhak. He owns a business. Uh, somebody I, that I hope when, when I write historical fiction, somebody that you can get to know, relate to, um, and uh, maybe step into his shoes. And that way, you know, historical fiction is... is I, my way of thinking, an extraordinary genre because I can ask you to take a journey back in time to another time and place and you can uh, experience what happened maybe in a more personal way because you can identify with a character. When something happens you, you know, and you're confronted with some uh, decision to make, you can say, what decision would you make? You know, when, when Esther says we should get out of here and go live on a farm somewhere, would you make that decision? Well, maybe maybe you would now, knowing what you knew then, but maybe you wouldn't when maybe you wouldn't then. So anyway, uh, Eli, of course, is is doing everything that he can do uh, to protect his his family. Um, and 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 what steps would you take? Uh, he, he he comes in contact with uh, a, a scurrilous profiteer. Uh, 
a guy named Maximilian, a man who cozies up to the Nazis, um, uh, plies them with uh, wine and women and, uh, and, and gains a, a great deal of influence. And then he sells that, uh, sells that influence by way of favors uh, to, uh, to the downtrodden people of, of Lublin. He can get you off of a, portation, a deportation list. He can keep you in your home. He can keep your wife from being sent far away to a, uh, to a work camp. Um, he has that kind of influence. And so uh, Eli depends on him. Eli depends on him to save his, uh, save his family. Um, the, the, uh, what, 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 what they did in Lublin, there were 46,000 Jews at the beginning of the war in, in Lublin. And, and of course the Nazis were, were designed, their, their design was to make all these cities free of Jews, Juden free. And uh, the, uh, the, the, they would collect the Jews, concentrate them as it were, and put them into uh, ghettos, and then uh, make sure that they uh, took as many as they could and found as many as they could, and then took them off and, and put them in, the, in, in work camps. So this is, picture of the, the Nazi order police uh, on what they would call a Jew hunt, just to go find people that, that were trying to hide from them and, and send them off uh, and deport them to either camps or to or workstations and things like that. Anyway, that's, that's the first part of the book. I don't really want to say too much about it if you haven't, if you haven't read it, um, as to what happens to Lee, Eli and his wife and his children. And and whether this Maximilian ever comes through with his promise to, to protect them all. Um, but the second part of the book uh, takes place in a displaced persons camp uh, called Fehrenwald. Uh, the Fehrenwald displaced persons camp is located in uh, southern Germany, um, in, in the Munich area. Uh, after the war, when the war ended uh, in, in 1945, very abruptly in May, uh, there were a million people displaced. In other words, they weren't at their home. They were somewhere else in Europe. Uh, they were displaced people. 250,000 of them were Jews that had nowhere to go. They couldn't go back to where they came from uh, and they really had nowhere to go. What they wanted to do, of course, was to emigrate to uh, either to the United States uh, or to England or to uh, uh, British uh, Palestine. Um, but the borders are closed to them. Uh, 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 quotas are, uh, immigration quotas are so strict at that time uh, that they really can't get there and they really don't have the wherewithal to get there anyway. Uh, and so the allies set up a number of camps where um, uh, people could live uh, on a temporary basis until they could get themselves, uh, get themselves well, they could get themselves uh, trained for, uh, for an occupation and await a visa to go somewhere. And so that's what these camps were. This is a picture from the Fairwell camp uh, where, where uh, perhaps it's occupational training um, for these women. And, and uh, in these camps, of course, uh, Jew Jewish communities are trying to reconstruct themselves. How do you do that? You do that with families. I can't tell you how many people that I've talked to now uh, whose parents were married in a displaced persons camp. Uh, who's, who, I've, I've, met, I've met people who were born in a displaced persons camp because it, 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 that, that's the way that, that you get your life back together and you reconstruct your community. It's, it, is, it is by, by family. Uh, and, and of course, this is a picture here from a Hanukkah celebration at Farnwell. Um, well, in, in, in Fehrenwald, um, we, we see that, that Eli is there. He is there with his son, Itzhak, and Esther is missing. They don't know where she is. They want to find her, but it's post-war Europe, and there are a lot of missing people, a lot of displaced. She could be anywhere, uh, and uh, they're waiting for a visa. That, that's the, the ironic thing. It, here are all these people in these displaced persons camps. They have survived. Many of them, they have survived concentration camps or work camps uh, or slave labor camps. Uh, and then now they find themselves in yet another camp 
now they they're, they don't they're not brutal conditions uh, they're, they're treated as well as they can but it's a camp they don't want to be in a camp they want to get on with their lives these, these are staging platforms um, but they can't do that unless they have a visa they have to be able to get to somewhere they have to go the United States has to let them in and in 1945 and 46 the visas were very very uh, tightly administered anyway along comes uh, a profiteer again uh, who is selling visas on the black market. He can get you into the United States uh, with the payment of money. Um, is this Maximilian? Is it the same guy? Uh, is this a confrontation? If it is, uh, maybe Eli can confront him and find out what happened to Esther. Anyway, that's in the story. You'll have to read that for yourself. Um, third part takes place again in America uh, in a landing spot for uh, Jewish refugees. In, uh, in the Chicago area, it was Albany Park. Um, Russians, Poles, Lithuanians, uh, Croatians, uh, uh, all these uh, different Jewish communities, the Jewish refugees wind up in, uh, in Albany Park. And uh, li like it said, it, uh, you can stand on the corner of Lawrence and Kedzie and you can hear seven different languages. Well, Eli finds himself in Albany Park uh, he is now working for the government, and he is on the uh, on the trail of a uh, of a, a profiteer. Uh, what's a profiteer doing in Albany Park in 1965? Well, the Vietnam War is uh, is gearing up, and uh, uh, unscrupulous people and corrupt politicians are making money off of kickbacks from military contractors. Uh, and so this is uh, uh, this is something that Eli gets involved in. Could that profiteer again be Maximilian? Well, you you'll have to see. Maybe that is one of the connections that keeps all these time periods together. Well, this is what's coming out next fall. Now that you asked, um, and I love this story. I love the story not not because I wrote the story, but I love the story of Denmark. This is a story of Denmark. Uh, Denmark was was unique in the Second World War, uh, and it's a lovely story, a wonderful story, uh, how Denmark as a country rescued all of its Jews, uh, and and it, it's it's extraordinary. It, it, at Yad Vashem, at, at in the garden out there where they have the righteous among the nations, uh, and they honor individuals. Uh, non-Jewish individuals who helped Jews during the Holocaust, there is a section that honors Denmark as a country, as a whole, uh, for what they did in rescuing, uh, rescuing their, their, their Jewish citizens. Um, Hitler had, uh, uh, Himmler had, uh, had set the word out that they were going to arrest all the Jews in Denmark. They were going to do it on Rosh Hashanah because they knew they would be home. It wouldn't be a work. And uh, the word got out uh, and the Danish people hid all the Jews. They hid them in the hospitals. They hid them in the churches. They hid them in their homes, in the attics, in the basements. Uh, and out of 7,600 Jews in Denmark, uh, only all but 400 were saved. In the middle of the night, they put them in fishing boats, took them from Denmark to Sweden, where there was sanctuary for them. All but 400 were saved. It's an extraordinary story. Uh, and, and defending Britistein is about that period. It's about that time. And uh, so that, that uh, will bring me to the end uh, of my spiel. And uh, I'm happy to uh, answer questions if, if there are any. Well, let me see if there's any in the chat. No, I don't see any in the chat. I think we're all taking this in. This is so <laughs> much information and it, it's unbelievable to hear the evolution of your writing and the different stories, uh, just fascinating. Um, but if, if you don't uh, wanna put something in the chat, you could also unmute yourself and ask a question. Uh, Dana, you want to say anything? I just want to say thank you to Ron for going through all your books because I've enjoyed 
reading every one of them and uh, bringing them back to life uh, was a delight. Um, I thought Eli's promise, I love, like I said, I love the way you took us from uh, Lublin and World War II to the displaced persons camp to the present time in, in the suburb of Chicago and how we got a, a, to see the timeline of how, how the world progressed, uh, how the Jews progressed, how they became immigrants to the US um, and specifically Eli, who was you know, real, a real strong, likable, wonderful main character. Um, you know, he's, he's great. And uh, hopefully people have read the book, uh, but if they haven't, uh, it is a delightful book and watching what happens in Eli's life and what happens to Esther and how he progresses in his life and finds happiness. Uh, like you said, people in displaced persons camps, you know, had to find their happiness out of tragedy. And uh, Eli was no exception to that fact. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's a lovely book um, as I think all of your books are. And we will definitely be watching in the fall for Defending Britta Stein. And uh, I will certainly be reading that and putting it on our list. Um, you can rest assured and any subsequent books you write and maybe you'll come back for another Zoom meeting after, uh, after we read that one. Um, I don't know if anyone has questions, yeah, yeah. Um, but Eli's promise is, uh, you know, it, like all of your books, it really um, makes you realize how fortunate we are to live in this time, um, have the freedoms that we have and not have to make the difficult choices and go through the difficulties that uh, the Jews of, of the you know, 30s and 40s and 50s had to endure um, and why you know, and how the Jewish people are as strong as they are today uh, because of what their ancestors, their parents, their grandparents, and now, now great grandparents for the young generation uh, had to endure and go through. Um, and, and with Eli, you know, we get to see his resilience and strength and how he was able to, you know, endure what, what he had to endure in Lublin and Lodz when he had to go to Lodz and, uh, and then the displaced persons camp and how, I mean, that had to be just horrible for the people to, to finally survive the war and then be, you know, be put into a displaced persons camp and have to live there for years, some of them. Yeah. So, um, you know, yeah. it's, uh, yeah. It must have seemed like such a freedom once they got to Palestine or America or South America or Canada or wherever. Um, and uh, but it must have been such a scary and yet freeing experience for all of them to finally get, you know, to a free country where they were treated like human beings for the first time in a long time. So um, I I really enjoyed the book. I uh, enjoyed getting to know Eli. Um, Sorry to see it in, you know, <laughs> but um, but it was a satisfying end, and you did a great job. And uh, if anybody else has questions, please feel free. I'm going to um, leave the meeting. My daughter had twins a few weeks ago, and I took the morning off. To uh, I've been I've been there like 12 to 16 hours a day every day helping her with the babies. So I'm gonna be back on duty for the 12 o'clock meeting. <laughs> so. Thank you for coming. But Ron, thank, thank you, you for so leading much. this. Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you for, we for actually had a uh, somebody has a question, Gary yeah, Miller, I and I yeah, see he's yeah, muted. I have, I have oh, a question. So I have a question, uh, Ron. Um, uh, I'm just fascinated in, in in your books and the historic fiction. I'm, I'm yeah. an, I, I've been an engineer my entire career, which is the probably yeah. the furthest thing from what a writer would be. Yes. But I'm fascinated by the creativity. Well, I, of, I won't need and, any for three months. If somebody is, is not uh, muted. Um, but but I'm, fa I'm fascinated by, uh, by the creativity of the writing, the historical fiction. I discovered you. And uh, now I've read uh, every single book you've written. And I'm looking forward to the next one. I even pre-ordered Eli's uh, <laughs> promise. Uh, but I'm just curious. It's a general question. I wonder if you could answer it briefly. How do you go from the concept of a life experience of being in Italy or in, in Poland, having the concept in your mind, and then all of a sudden all this creativity and a wonderful story comes out that ends up in a book? Like, what's, what's the process that goes on between 
between your your experience in Poland versus having a book that's actually published that people love to read on, in historic uh, fiction. Um, I assume you might have some kind of a blackboard or a whiteboard up with characters and planning all this. Like, <laughs> no, how, I don't how, do that. Uh, how does that work? <laughs> I don't. I don't do that. Well, usually. It, 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 a concept comes to me that, that I want to explore. I mean, I write historical fiction. And I often say, you know, it's a little like cheating because my back, background story has already been written. All I have to do is uh, devise characters and a plot and weave them into the background that already exists. But um, a concept will come to me and I will, uh, I'll, I'll just research the heck out of it. And, and maybe that will evolve into uh, something that I'll say, okay, I, I, can, I can pursue this. Uh, this. This will make a good story. And maybe sometimes I'll, I'll research a lot and it just, a, there just won't be a story there. Um, but that, before I even start writing, I, uh, I do, uh, you know, at least a couple months worth of research. Uh, just, just reading, just a lot of reading. Sometimes I travel to the place and um, hire a historian, take me around and show me places. And uh, so, I, I mean, it's, there's, there's a lot of research and uh, a lot of note taking and a try then to make uh, a rough outline. And uh, I, I don't put up, I don't paste things on the wall or on a storyboard, but, it, but, it, but it's that kind of thing. And, and I do, I do have then just tons of notes uh, and then ultimately then when I've got a good idea of where I'm going, I'll, uh, I'll start writing it. We but have a you. question in the chat. Uh, let me just get that. Any movie plans? Your book seems to be very adaptable to the screen. There is talk um, about um, Once We Were Brothers. But the movie industry is kind of uh, in a strange place today. And so we'll just have to see. Okay. And uh, Dana wrote a note. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you again, Ron. And there's a, uh, a note from Carol Douglas, but I can't seem to access it. Um, so any other questions before we, oh, we have hands up. Okay. Um, Nancy, why don't you uh, take the next one? Sure. First, I just wanted to say thank you to Ron. Um, I've loved your books and I love a book that you can't put down and that's how I feel about your books. So thank you for that. And I had a question because sometimes you don't know on the historical fiction what's fact and what's, what's fiction. So I was interested in the, when they said it was sent out by Morse code on April, 1945. Yeah. I, I've read a lot of Holocaust books and never heard of that. And so I wanted to know if that was true. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm really, dedicated to making sure that my background story is authentic. The people are authentic. The events are authentic. I try to portray them in the most authentic way I can. Uh, I think if you write a story uh, of historical fiction, especially one about the Holocaust, uh, you cannot be careless with the facts. Uh, and I don't think that, that, but obviously my characters and their situation and their relationships are uh, uh, imaginary. But uh, the people that they come in contact with, uh, the officers, uh, the, the, um, um, the, 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 the principal Nazi characters, they're all real. And, and yes, that uh, when that message went out uh, from Buchenwald, it was, uh, it was sent just like that. And what, can I ask one more question, Jerry? Of course. Uh, the other thing I'm interested in is it said, in, I think in the displaced per, uh, per, person's camp or whatever, um, that there were a lot of babies being born. And I've uh, always wondered how, how these women after going through what they went through could have babies so soon after. It seems like their bodies were like starved. And I just wondered if there was any, if you ever saw any research on that. Some of them couldn't, some of them couldn't. And some of them never could. And um, th that was an issue, but that, again, to try, and, and that was something that I, I had read quite a bit about, but I didn't want to put too much of that in, in the book. 
but there were a lot of women, maybe to prove that they were a woman and that they could once again re, re, regain their uh, position in life uh, as a woman, as a mother and as a wife and, and that they wanted to have children, maybe for, for that reason as well. And many could not. And Marcy, uh, you have a question. Do you wanna mute yourself? Yeah, I was trying to do that. Um, thank you very much, Ron. This has been extremely interesting. I, I also have read all the books and they're just fascinating. Um, um, do you have family history through the Holocaust or through any of these experiences that you've heard stories? I have a very good friend of ours through the um, Holocaust. She goes around, her mother lectured to middle school children about their experiences, her and her, her, and her husband, and now, they've both have passed away and now my friend goes around and tells their story and how they survived and found each other afterwards and um it's it's very interesting so yours are so real i didn't know if any of this was from real life stories that your family have told my family um thankfully was not uh, in the holocaust they were not in europe during that period of time they my family mostly came over, both on my mother's and my father's side, from uh, Russia and from Ukraine um, at the turn of the century, in the 1890s, 1900s, uh, to escape the pogroms. Uh, but uh, so, no, it, those stories, um, they come from reading. You can read a lot of personal stories and gain a lot of information about what people experienced and what they thought and how they were affected. Uh, you can, there are so many personal stories available uh, through the museums, through, uh, through the uh, websites. Uh, Yad Vashem has a website, uh, Holocaust Museum has a website and, um, and personal stories are available. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have one more comment in the uh, chat. Uh, first, she says, I love the photos at the end of each book. And the other comment was, do you write on paper, typewriter, computer? Do you write in the uh, night? No, <laughs> I, I, no I, I use my computer. I use my computer. And do you tend to write on weekends, afternoon or night? I have no uh, set time that I write. Um, I write when some ideas come to me that I think I need to get them down. Uh, or I write when all my other distractions give me time to write. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, that looks like it. Um, this was fascinating, very, very wonderful presentation. And we thank you so much for joining us. And we look forward to your next book and a next visit with you. So, uh, take care of yourself in that snow there. Oh, and, I know. <laughs> uh, and uh, 